One of the things that Mendy uh, was so passionate about was uh, Torah learning, and he did not believe that it needed to be uh, in any particular stream of Judaism. His dream was to bring a dedicated Partners in Torah to Cleveland, uh, modeled after other communities throughout the United States with one-on-one -on -one learning. He was a real, he was a person that was dedicated to solving problems, and uh, and that's what, what's greatly missed and is incumbent upon us to take the learning that we have uh, in the Torah and, uh, and put it to use and to put it to use every single day to make sure that, uh, that we are picking up where he, where he, left, where he left behind and, um, and to take the, um, the, the social challenges that we're currently um, experiencing as a community, the individual challenges that we're having as a community, and, and tackling them and making uh, our community a better place. And that's what he was about, and that's what we hope uh, that all of us can, can pick that up and continue that in the, in the work and the efforts that he taught us for so many years. Good evening, and welcome to the second annual Partners in Torah Mindy Klein Memorial Lecture. Tonight we remember the founder of Partners in Torah of Cleveland, Mendy Klein, Menachem Moshe bin Naftali Hertz Gazetzal. And as we remember Mendy, we're going to focus on a topic that is so apropos to who Mendy was. The topic for tonight is finding the divine in everything, because Mendy was truly somebody who found the divine everywhere that he looked in his life. I'd like to start with the story of a young man named Armin. Armin was a successful businessman in Hungary before the war, married with three children, living what would seem to be a wonderful life. Then in March of 1944, the Nazis Yamach Shemam invaded Hungary, taking over the country and deporting almost all of Hungary's 800,000 Jews. Armin was one of the early ones to be deported, being sent to a concentration camp, being put to forced labor as so many Jews were during the war. Eventually, he was sent to Auschwitz, as were his wife and three children. His wife and three children unfortunately perished in the gas chambers of Auschwitz. But our men made it to the day of the death march, that 35-mile treacherous march on which many people did not survive. And our men and some of his friends, knowing what was coming ahead, said, you know what? If we go on the march, it's certain death. If we stay here and try and hide out in the camp, maybe, just maybe, we'll survive. So our men and his friends hid out in one of the barracks when the Jews deported on the death march. And sure enough, there was a Nazi guard who eventually found them hiding in the barracks. The Nazi put on his revolver and pointed it at our men and said, You know that now I have to kill you. Our men said, What do you mean? The Nazis already killed us years ago. To which the soldier responded, you know what, you're right. And they killed me too, and my family, and my children, and everything that I have. Putting down his revolver, the Nazi soldier started crying. And he spent the next several hours guarding the outside of that barrack, making sure that no other Nazi walked in, until at four in the morning when the Russians finally showed up to officially liberate the camp. The Nazi guard came in and said, you're free to go. Then there's a young lady by the name of Jolan, also in Auschwitz. Jolan's fate was not quite like our men's. One day in one of those infamous selections that we all know too much about, she was sent in the wrong direction and sent off to the gas chambers. But on that day, somehow, the Nazi precision seemed to fail, and so did that gas chamber. So Jolan was able to live a few weeks longer. But if she was selected once, sure enough, she was selected once again, again being sent to her death in the gas chambers. But on that day, the Red Cross showed up for one of their surprise visits to see how the Nazis were treating the Jews. So of course, the Nazis shut down the gas chambers, sent everyone back to their barracks, and tried to put on the best show they possibly could for the Red Cross. Again, Jolan looking death in the eyes and surviving. And this is the story of our men in Jolan, who eventually met after the war in a DP camp in Hungary, knowing that they both escaped such a terrible fate, knowing that in a miraculous way they were both saved from the hands of the Nazis Yamach Shemam. They met, they connected, 
and they married, giving birth to none other than Mendy Klein. Mendy and his parents lived in the DP camp in Hungary until eventually it was clear that after the war, the Soviets were taking over. Even though in the first election after the war in Hungary, the communists only won 17% of the vote, still it was clear that Hungary was going to be a Soviet country and it was going to be no place for the Jews. So the Klein family picked up, left Hungary, which was their home, and came for America. They settled in Williamsburg, which at that time was nothing like Williamsburg is today. They joined the small fledgling community of survivors that would become the great Satmar community of today. Mendy was sent to a Satmar Cheder, but he was never one who excelled in his studies. In fact, our men, Mendy's father, would tell him, My son, God blessed you with a brain and cursed you with a mouth, so you will never be able to hold down a job. Mendy took this directive of his father and never had a boss. At the age of 16, when Mendy got his driver's license, he was able to start a taxi, a taxi cab business, and that's what he did for the next number of years. Not being too successful, eventually he decided to move to Cleveland, where he had an uncle, and he worked in his uncle's fruit stand in the Northern Ohio Food Terminal for 13 years. I once asked him, Mendy, like, what possessed you to come to Cleveland? How in the world did you end up here? To which Mendy would always respond, I was lucky. When in truth, those of us living here in Cleveland were really the lucky ones. In 1990, Mendy sold his portion of the fruit stand and started a company that would become known as Safeguard Properties, a company that managed bank-owned properties, foreclosed properties, which had been a pretty good business in the 90s up until the 2000s. And that's when Mendy Klein made the unbelievable wealth that he was privileged to make. Now, Mendy had a certain outlook on the wealth that he made. He told me more than once, I have no clue why HaKadosh Baruch Hu, why God gave me such wealth. But if He gave me this wealth, it must mean that I have to give it to others. And that's what he proceeded to do. Mindy retired from the family business from Safeguard Properties, a business generating well over half a billion dollars a year, turning it over to his son-in-law, Amir Jaffa, and his children. And he opened what is known as a family office, where he would literally sit and focus all day on the tzedakahs, on the charities that he was passionate about. In fact, when his son Nati eulogized his father, Mindy, he told of an incident that happened one year when they were looking over the profit and loss sheet, the balance sheet for the family office. And Nati says to his father, he says, Ta, we, give, we spend 30% of the income into this business running the business. The other 70% we're giving to Tzedakah. It's not sustainable long term. To which Mendy responded, what? So you want me to give less Tzedakah? And that was that. I had a personal experience with Mendy shortly before he passed away. Dare I say it was just a few weeks before he passed away. Where certain people in the Cleveland community were questioning how the family divvies out their charity dollars. And I felt that it was necessary to make a macha. I felt it was inappropriate for a family that was so philanthropic, that gave so much to the community, to be subject to people fetching and complaining about how they gave out their tzedakah. So I made a public macha, saying this person was completely out of line, and in, my, and in my protest, I outlined so many of the charities in the community that Mindy and his family supported. When Mindy found out about this, I knew I was going to be in trouble. And he came up to me and pointed his hand at me like this. And he said, Rabbi, I heard what you did. I appreciate it, but you shouldn't have done it. My father used to tell me, there's only one place where they write down all of your accomplishments. And that's on your matseva. That's on your tombstone. And sure enough, just a short time later, Mendy took leave of the world, leaving behind his amazing legacy, leaving behind his tremendous philanthropy where he supported so many organizations, 
not the least of which were the Jewish Federation of Cleveland, the Hebrew Academy of Cleveland, Yeshiva Derech HaTorah of Cleveland, the Tells Yeshiva, Fuchs Mizrahi School, Yeshiva High School of Cleveland, Agudas Yisrael of Ohio and Agudas Yisrael of North America, the Friendship Circle, Amudim, Cleveland Chesed Center, Youth Torah Center, Matam Beseser, Biker Cholim, the Cleveland Mikvah, Yeshiva's Avas Torah, the six Cholim in Cleveland that he built and sustained, Asia Torah, JFX, JLC, and of course, Partners in Torah of Cleveland, and this is in no way an exhaustive list of all that he did. Many of these organizations were not only held up by him, but were completely supported by his tzedakah, by his philanthropy. So Mindy said that he was lucky to have moved to Cleveland, but really, we here in Cleveland, and really everybody amongst the Jewish people, were lucky to have somebody like Menachem Moshe bin Naftali Herzka, Mindy Klein, Zechron Levracha. He was truly somebody who found the divine everywhere. Everywhere that he looked. He saw Kodesh Baruch Hu. He saw the Almighty. And there were times when he would see people who were so downtrodden. Anytime you were in his house, it was such an amazing thing. His house from the outside was just a regular Beachwood, Ohio house. You wouldn't know that it was the house of a multimillionaire philanthropist. And that house at any given point was a Grand Central Station. Yabad Chaim, his, his widow Ita, worked so hard to take care of all the amazing people who came through that house. Whether they be poor people asking for help or great Hasidic Rebbe's, everyone was treated like a king in that house. So those of us here are the ones who are truly at loss. All of us, to a certain extent, are his Yosemim. All of us, to a certain extent, are his orphans. He was truly one who saw the divine in everything that he did and in everything that he saw. So along these lines, we want to focus a little bit on this idea of finding the divine. And in truth, this is something that everybody struggles with. I'll start off by telling you a story of a man who was running very late to a business meeting. And it was gridlock traffic. He knew that if a miracle didn't happen, he was going to be late. And finally, the traffic lightens up, but still, he only has a few minutes to get up to the meeting, and it's impossible to find parking outside of this office building. So he starts praying to God, even though he was not a religious man. He says, God, just help me find a parking space. I promise, when I get up tomorrow morning, I'll put on tefillin, and I'll pray, and I'll start saying brachos, and I'll, I'll do everything the way you want me to. Just then, a car pulls out right in front of the building, and the man's able to slip in there, and before he does, he looks up and says, Oh, no thanks, God. I got it from here. And unfortunately, that's how we all lead our lives. We don't realize that the divine is everywhere. We don't realize the miracles that are right there in front of us. And a few weeks ago, we just celebrated Pesach, and in a few short weeks, we're going to celebrate Shavuos. And in both of these Yom Tovim, we have tremendous miracles that we celebrate. On Shavuos, we're going to celebrate Maimed Har Sinai, when the Jews stood at Mount Sinai and heard a Kodesh Baruch Hu say the Aseris Adibros, the Ten Commandments. Yet a mere 40 days later, they're going to be dancing around a golden calf because, like God, what have you done for me lately? And in, Eretz, and in Mitzrayim, when the Jews were in Egypt, we saw the same exact thing with the plagues. We saw that with every single plague, the Egyptians found a way to rationalize it away. Whether it be the plague of Dam, of blood, where everything turned to blood. But they were able to rationalize that away. You know why? Because their sorcerers could also turn water to blood. There was only one problem. Where did they get water from if all the water had turned to blood? So our sages tell us that the only way that Egyptians could get water was to buy it from a Jew because Jewish water did not turn to blood and the water that was purchased from a Jew did not automatically turn to blood. So imagine the scene for a minute. The sorcerers in Egypt want to show that they're just as powerful as a Kodesh Baruch Hu. So they say, Moshe, that's nothing that you could turn water to blood. Watch what we're going to do. Um, hey, Moshe, here's 10 bucks. Can we, get a, can we get a glass of water over here? Sure, here you go. Here, watch, we'll turn it to blood. Wow, we can do what you can do. Yeah, then why do I have your 10 bucks? And it goes on throughout the plagues of Rodea, Kidi, Barad, through all the plagues, the Egyptians are able to rationalize it away until we get to the final plague of Makos Bechoros, the slaying of the firstborn. And in that plague, it's a fascinating thing because the Torah tells us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to bring the plague Kechatzoi Salayla, which literally means around midnight. 
I mean, this is a Kodesh Baruch Hu for crying out loud. Don't you think he could be exact in the time and say that I am bringing the slaying of the firstborn at midnight? Why did he say around midnight? The Gemara tells us that a Kodesh Baruch Hu was worried that the Egyptians would be a little off in their calculations. You know, it was nighttime, sundials don't work at night, and they would be sitting there doing their countdown, and if the slaying of the firstborn didn't happen right according to their midnight, maybe they would think it didn't come from Hashem. Again, imagine the situation. You're sitting there and you're an Egyptian the night of the slaying of the firstborn, the night of the first Seder, and you're counting down on your watch. Ten, nine, eight. Coming out, ah, Ahmed's dead! Ah, Muhammad's dead! And all you, there's screams throughout Egypt, people are dropping dead all over the place, and then someone says, oh, 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 oh. wait a second, three, two, one, ah, Moshe, you're off by eight seconds, it's not really God. Really? That's how people think? And the answer is yes, that is how people think, because people have a, such a hard time seeing Hashem's hand when it is so open and apparent. You know, there's a famous quote that is attributed to Fred Hoyle, who is a British astronomer, to where he says that the probability of a, of a tornado sweeping through a junkyard and assembling a 747 aircraft is the same probability of life coming from nothing as we know that it did. So again, this is a great astronomer saying that the probability that we're even in existence, that one bacteria should come into existence, is so radical, is so minute. Yet Fred Hoyle himself, was still an atheist. And in truth, we're all the same way to a certain extent. We see the divine in front of us all the time. We see, we see works of medical, we see works of our health and our body and medicine and, and science and, and, and engineering and everything in front of our eyes. And it's so clear that there's such miraculous things in this world. Yet we always try and rationalize it away as to be something else besides God. It reminds me of a great story I once heard of Rabbi Refsen from Neve Yerushalayim who was speaking at some sort of science and religion conference. And there was some astronomer that got up before him and said, ah, I don't know so much about, about the Bible, I don't know so much about religion, but I think you can sum it all up as just be good to one another. Okay, he spoke and sat down, then Rabbi Refsen gets up, and if you know Rabbi Refsen, he's not such a tall man, has a beautiful British accent. Rabbi Refsen said, I don't know so much about astronomy, but I believe it can all be summed up as twinkle, twinkle, little star. Right? No one would have the audacity to say that about science, yet about religion we say, oh, it's no big deal, it's just be good to another person and the details don't matter. Because we're so quick to pass it off. We're so quick not to see the divine everywhere where we look. And you know, people often tell me, you know what, Rabbi? The problem is there's no miracles anymore. If there was really a miracle, then I would believe, then I'd be religious, then I'd do whatever it is that the Torah says and what God wants of me. And the answer is no, you wouldn't. No, they wouldn't. And the answer comes straight out of the story with Elio and Navi, the greatest of prophets ever to be given to the Jewish people. We see the story of Elio, of Elio and Navi at the end of Sefer Malachim, the, the first, uh, first Sefer Malachim. And he's the king over Israel when the evil king Ahav, I'm sorry, he's the prophet over Israel when the evil king Ahav is king. Now the Navi tells us that out of the eight kings that preceded Ahav, Ahav was the worst. So out of all the kings of Israel, the 20 kings that would rule over the northern kingdom of Israel, Ahav was the worst of them. And part of the reason he was so bad was because he was married to Ezebel, he's married to Jezebel, who came from Sidon and brought much of her idolatrous ways into the kingdom of Israel. Needless to say, the nation had fallen to a terrible low, a terrible low where much of Odazar, much idol worship was practiced throughout the whole country. And finally, Elio and Navi, as the prophet is trying to influence the people for good, says, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm making a famine until the Avodah stops in this country. And a famine is proclaimed on the country of Israel. And the famine lasts not for one year, not for two years, but for three years. Finally, after three years, Akodesh Baruch Hu, God says to Elio, oh, he says, okay, Elio, I think it's enough. It's time for you to go out and finish the job. Fine. So Elio comes out of hiding. Now, all this time he was hiding in a cave. And he finally confronts Ahav, the king. And it's, it's, it's a hilarious scene as described by the prophet where, where 
where Ahab sees Elio and he says, Oh, look, there's the Eicher Yisrael. There's the tormentor of the Jewish people, the troubler of Israel. To which Elio says, You think I'm the Eicher Yisrael? You're the Eicher Yisrael. Look in the mirror, big guy. To which Ahab says, No, you're the Eicher Yisrael. No, you're the Eicher Yisrael. No, you're the Eicher Yisrael. Seeing pretty soon that they're not getting anywhere going about it this way. Finally, Elio says, Fine. You know what? Enough. We're not getting anywhere with this. So, I challenge you to a duel. Now, this wasn't a duel like Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, where they, you know, take 20 steps and turn around and shoot. This is a much different duel. Elio said, I'm going to prove to the Jewish people once and for all that the Avodah Zara that you're involved with is absolutely worthless. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go up to Mount Carmel and... I'm going to let you bring 450 priests of Baal and 400 priests of the Asherah tree, and it will be all of them versus me. So it's 850 to 1. And we're going to bring two bulls, and we're going to let your team have first pick, take whatever bull they want. And not only that, but I'll give them home field advantage. We'll let them win the toss. We'll let them go first. So Elio gives seemingly every advantage to the priests of Baal and Asherah that he was going up against. But he made one rule. He said, we're going to bring these bulls, and we're going to bring an offering, and we're going to have the wood, we're going to have the bull, but no fire allowed. And you guys are going to do all your prayers or whatever you do to the priests of Baal and to the Asherah tree, and you know what? If there's legitimacy to what you're doing, a fire will come down from heaven and consume your bull. And me, I'm going to pray to Hashem and we'll see what happens. So it's early in the morning. They went up for the duel. Elio gives the wood and the bull and everything to the 850 opponents. And he says, go ahead, you go first. And they start doing all of their stuff. They're singing and they're dancing and they're cutting and whatever it is that they do. To, and after like a few hours of this, Elio says, you know what? Maybe your God can't hear you. Maybe you got to yell a little louder. Maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe he's sleeping. Like really like tormenting them as they would go. And they continue to cut themselves. And our sages tell us that even though fire wasn't allowed in the duel, they were able to, out of 850 of them, they could smuggle up some fire, some, some, uh, some Flintstones, and be able to try and actually make some fire. But that didn't even work for them. And after hours of trying this, nothing they would do brought down a fire to consume their bull. At which point, Elio says to the Jewish people looking on, he says the faithful words, Ad masayatim poschim shnei Until when will you people straddle the fence? Because it wasn't like the Jews at that time just worshipped Baal and Asherah. They were worshipping Baal and Asherah and also practicing as Jews. It was like Jews for Getschkalach. I mean, they were, they were going to Shul on Shabbos and they were going to the Temple of Baal on Sunday. And by the way, we're also told that when Elio was hiding out from Ahav, that he was supported by a raven who would bring him food from Ahav's palace. Which begs the question, why would Elio and Navi, the great prophet, the great rabbi, eat food from an evil person's house, from Ahav's house? Wasn't it Traif? And the answer is no. Ahav kept a glot kosher palace. Because that was the situation at the time. They were straddling the fence. So Elio says, Until when are you going to straddle the fence? If Hashem's your God, go with Hashem. And if Baal's your God, stop straddling the fence. And he calls up some of his servants and he says, Take a jug of water and dump it on my wood. And then he says, come on up and take another jug of water and dump it on my wood. And he totally saturates the area so it was clear that all pi derech according to nature, no fire would consume that wood. And then Elio Navi says three words. Aneni Hashem Aneni. Answer me, Hashem, answer me, at which time a fire came down from heaven, consumes his bull. The whole Jewish people from the nation of Israel looking on said, Hashem hu Elohim, Hashem hu Elohim, Hashem is our God. Elio clearly, without a doubt, wins the duel. He's able to slaughter the 850 priests of Baal and Asherah. And Elio looks like he's really done his job and everything is taken care of. At which point Yezebel, who didn't show up at the match, 
Yisavel, the evil queen, says, Elio, that was beautiful. I loved it. That thing with pulling the water, beautiful. That thing with taunting the priest of Baal and the priest of Sherah, divine. You were great. Absolutely fabulous. You win, hands down. But don't worry. We're going to kill you tomorrow. <laughs> what? What do you mean you're going to kill me tomorrow? I just won. The whole Jewish people said, Hashem, who Elohim, Hashem, who Elohim. What do you mean you're going to kill me? So she said, yeah, yeah, they're saying Hashem, who Elohim today, but it'll all wear off by tomorrow. To which Elio said, you know what? You're 100% right. And Elio said, you know what? I'm done. I retire as a Navi. I'm taking off my Navi hat and I'm just running away to die out in the desert. And he goes out into the desert and a Kodesh Baruch Hu confronts him. And he says, Elio, let me show you something. And he brings a big, huge tornado and the wind is going crazy and sand is all over the place and cactuses are flying or whatever it is. Amazing sign of the strength of Hashem. And, El and Hashem asks Elio, he says, Elio, you like that? And he says, yeah, Hashem, that's great. He says, let me show you something else. And then Hashem makes a big earthquake in front of him and the whole earth opens up and things start falling in and it's a Rosh Gadol and it's amazing, it's great. And Hashem says to Elio, Elio, you like that? He says, yeah, Hashem, that's amazing. He says, let me show you one more thing. And he brings a huge fire that comes through the desert and just consumes everything in his wake. And he says to Hashem, and he says to Elio, Elio, you like that? He says, yeah, Hashem, I like that. And Hashem says to Elio, Elio, you just don't get it. You think that people are influenced by this big Rosh Gadol? You think people are influenced by the big pomp and circumstance, by the big show that you put on? No, that is not what influences a person. You know what influences a person? It's the Kol de Mama Daka. It's the quiet, low, consistent voice. That's how you have an effect on the people. It's not through the Rosh Gadol, through the big sound of the pop and circumstance. It's the Kol de Mama Daka, that quiet, constant, consistent voice. That's how you have an influence on the people. If you want to see the divine in this world, you won't see it through big miracles. And even if you do see it through a big miracle, it's just going to wear off a few days later. But you see it through the Kol de Mama Daka, through the everyday small involvement, the everyday, the small things that the Almighty gives to us. In the Hakdama to the En Yaakov, he brings on a medrash. Now he says it's an idea that's attributed to a medrash, but he himself never found it in an actual medrash, and the En Yaakov is really the only source we have for it. The Maharal also quotes it. But this medrash says that there are three Tanayim that are talking, and each one says, Metzinu Pasa Kol Yoser, that we each have a verse of the Torah that in it encapsulates all of what the Torah is about. And Ben Zoma is the first one to talk, and he says his Pasa Kol Yoser is Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Achad. The verse that encapsulates the whole entire Torah is, Hear Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. To which Benanis responds, no, I have the Pasuk Kol Yoser, I have the verse that really encapsulates it all, and that's via Hafta L'Reacha Kimocha, love your friend as yourself, to which Rabbi Akiva agreed with him. Rabbi Akiva said, Zed Klal Gadol Torah, this is the great principle of the Torah. And then Ben Pazai says, no, I have a verse that beats all you out, I have a verse that includes everything. What verse is that? Bring one sheep in the morning and one sheep in the afternoon. Referring to in the, cor in the base of Midash, there was the Korban Tamid. In the Holy Temple, there was the daily offering. The daily offering was brought in the morning and the afternoon. One sheep in the morning, one sheep in the afternoon. That was the, what's called the Korban Tamid, the daily service that took place in the base of Midash. And says Ben Pazai, that that's the verse that encapsulates all the Torah? And the Medrash says that Halacha Keben Pazai, that Ben Pazai is right. That is the verse that sums up the whole entire Torah. Esa keves hachad taseb voker, the esa keves hashini taseb ben harabayim. Bring one sheep in the morning and one sheep in the afternoon. That is the summary of what it means to be a Jew. What in the world is this Medrash talking about? The Medrash is saying the same idea that a Kodesh Baruch Hu said to Elio and Navi. That it's not through big ideas that people are influenced. It's not through big ideas that you find the divine. Yes, Shema Yisrael is important. Yes, V'yahavta L'Recha Kamocha is important. 
But where you find Hashem, where you find the divine, is in the Esa Keves Hachat Taseb Boker, the Esa Keves Hashini Taseb Ben Harbaim. In that daily, morning, afternoon, Shachris, Min Chamariv, getting up, going to bed, acting like a Jew every single way, in the small ways, not necessarily in the big ways, but in the small ways. That's where we connect to Hashem, that's where we find Hashem, and that's where we find the divine. So it's not through the big pomp and circumstance that we see the divine in this world. It's through the kol de mama daka, through that quiet, constant voice that is in all the small actions that we do day in and day out. And it's through that esa keves hachat tasev avoker, the esa keves hashenit tasev ben harbaim, the consistency, the shachas min chamarik, every single day, morning, afternoon, evening, that's where we see the Almighty in this world. And this idea was truly exemplified by Rabbi Menachem Mendel bin Naftali Herzka Zatzal Mendy Klein. Because Mendy Klein saw the divine in everything that he did. When he retired from his business, he spent those last 10 years of his life working day and night for our Kodesh Baruch Hu, working on the charities. I would get emails from, en- from Mendy at 2, 3, 4 in the morning because he would deal with the regular people during the day and then deal with all his emails and do all his other work at night. They often say about Mendy, he maybe slept one to two hours a night in those days because he realized that influencing the Jewish world, that influencing the Jewish people doesn't come through big pomp and circumstance, making big shows. He could have given his money to do things like that, but no, it came through the quiet consistency of his actions. I'll tell you one last amazing story about Mendy. A couple years ago, I was in Sfas at the Ariz Mikvah in the famous... Beis Kavar is the famous cemetery of Tzfat. And I ran into an old friend of mine, and we were talking, and he said, what are you up to now? And I said, I'm living in Cleveland. He said, Cleveland? You know, I was just down at Kever Rachel, at Rachel's tomb, and I saw something amazing. It's the first time I've been there since they did this great refurbishment, this great reconstruction and rebuilding and renovation of the place. And I looked at the main plaque that described, that the main plaque that said, who gave the money to refurbish the Kever Rachel. And it said on it that it was the Jewish Federation of Cleveland. And I thought, that's interesting. I didn't realize that Jewish federations in North America cared about things like Kever Rachel, like Rachel's tomb. And I said, let me tell you the story behind that. The story is, there's a great man named Mendy Klein. And Mendy Klein once went to visit his son and his daughter-in-law in Eretz Yisrael, Nati and Chani. And he wanted to go to Kever Rachel. And when they got to Kever Rachel, he was disturbed by the fact that there was garbage everywhere. And he inquired to one of the workers there, like, what in the world is going on over here? To which the worker said, oh, well, the garbage, the garbage men are on strike right now, so the garbage isn't being picked up. If you've ever been to Eretz Yisrael, you know that only happens like every Monday and Thursday, but be it as it may, that's what was going on. And it bothered Mendy the whole way home that Mama Rachel was sitting surrounded by garbage. So when he gets back to Yerushalayim, they make a few phone calls, they find a private garbage service, and through their own, through Mendy's own money, he sends a private garbage service to Kever Rachel to clean up Rachel's tomb. But that wasn't enough. Because when he was there, he noticed also that the air conditioning wasn't working. So the next thing that he did was he put in a new air conditioning unit. And he noticed the guard tower had become decrepit. And he had that replaced. And before you knew it, he had totally refurbished the whole entire cave of Rachel. If you go there today, it's absolutely beautiful. But when it came time to dedicate it to the new building, Mendy wasn't going to put his name on it. He says again, everything I have is from Hashem. I'm a representative of the Cleveland Jewish community, and therefore the name that is going on cave of Rachel is the Cleveland Jewish community. Federation. That's because Mendy knew that it was the Kol de Mamadaka, that small, consistent, quiet voice. That's what made the difference. And being consistent about it. Like the Keves HaChad Taseh Vavoker and the Keves HaShaini Taseh Bein Harabayim. My dear friend and mentor of Pesach Kron tells an amazing idea. He says that the custom they were all familiar with when somebody passes away is the saying of the mourner's Kaddish. But if you look at the words of the mourner's Kaddish, it has nothing to do with memorializing the person who passed away. It's quite simply a Kaddish, words of praise of Hashem, sanctifying Hashem's name. So he said a fascinating idea, 
that why has this become the main mitzvah? This become the main thing that people do when their parents pass away. And he says you see it in the first words of the Kaddish. When the Kaddish starts off, we say the words, Yiskadal v'yiskadash shemei rabah. As if to say that when a person loses their parents, there's a tremendous void in the world. And now it's the job of their descendants to stand up and replace the void that their parents left behind. So what do those children do for 11 months after the parents pass away? They stand up and say, Yiskadal v'yiskadash shemei rabah. I'm going to be the one to fill that void and to sanctify God's name. Mendy left such a profound void in this world, a void of kol damamadaka, a quiet void of spreading himself wherever he could, helping out the downtrodden, wherever, whenever. And he left that void. And now it is for every single one of us to say, all of those of us who were inspired by Mendy Klein, to stand up and say, Yiskadal v'yiskadash, Shemei Rabbah. I thank you for listening. When you address some of, these, some of these issues, some of these serious issues, and you start seeing some results uh, of the work that you're doing, um, it makes you feel good, uh, but it also continues to encourage you to keep going, to keep working on it. And um, Fakul Tishbarko gave me the opportunity to uh, be able to help. Um, it's uh, an achrayis. It's not really not so much as a, an opportunity, it's more of an achrayis that you have to do.